Good evening. Uh, praise the Lord. Um, because of um, well, for the benefit of any visitors who are joining us tonight, my name is Kenny Rungu. I'm a member of Grace Point Church, and I'm grateful uh, even for uh, the opportunity uh, that I've gotten this evening to to be able to share in, with us. Um, so what I'm going to do in the next uh, sorry, uh, uh, what I'm going to do uh, for the next few minutes is just to help us look through this different, um, uh, this last commandment, and then um, you're going to be able to hear God's words together as we look at these 10 commandments. As a way uh, of introduction, I wonder how you would finish the following sentence. I wonder how you would finish uh, the following sentence. Um, if someone gives you um, a sentence and tells you to finish um, the following sentence, I wonder how you would finish it. If only I had dash, I would finally be happy. If only I had dash, I would finally be happy. Be honest with yourself. What feels your blank? What exactly? is the answer to this question for you. What is the one thing you would say to yourself that if you get it, you would finally be happy? What is that that would fit in the blank? If only I had dash, I would finally be happy. Now, if you're like me, um, I think um, that some of the answers that you have given in the blank or the way you have filled the blank is maybe if only I had a nicer house, I would finally be happy. If only I had a new car, newer car, I would finally be happy. Good looks, a successful career, sports, sportless health. And the list goes on and on. Now, as we come to this 10th commandment, we'll find in it a command from God to us, his rescued people. I do hope you have remembered, or you can be able to remember uh, how, if you have been with us from the first day when we started looking at these 10 commandments, how we were reminded that in the introduction that the 10 commandments are addressed to us believers so that we'll know what a covenant keeping God requires of his people. In other words, we were told that these 10 words or these 10 commandments do reveal the love that God has for us and even the expectation that God has for us, his redeemed and treasured people. Here in these 10 commandments, we find 10 words that are from the rescuer to the rescued people, that are from the Lord to his people. Now, in this last of the 10 words, we find a commandment that we must all admit we have broken or perhaps are now breaking or even we probably break in the future. It's for sure a commandment that many will find hard to keep. And the main reason for this is one. This command, the 10th commandment, addresses not only what we do, but even gets to the heart of our desires and our wants. You see, friends, in many cases, we get commands at school or even at home that deal with what we do outwardly. But God, unlike our school teachers or our parents, who are only able to read our behavior, God is able to read our mind. Yes, God is able and does read both our behavior and our mind. Yahweh, the one who gave us, gave us this law, these 10 words, reads our heart and our soul. He knows our desires and the deepest of our longings. And here in this 10th commandment, we clearly see him doing exactly that, reading our desires and our deepest of our longings. And then he calls us, his rescued people, to be fully satisfied in him and what he has given to us. He calls us to be content with what we have and what he has given us. He calls us from coveting what belongs to another person. So let me read this last uh, commandment uh, from Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. And then together we'll see what does God want uh, to teach us this evening from this 10th commandment. This is what the Bible says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. 
You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Let me read that again before we dive in and think what exactly this commandment calls us to do. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Very piercing words. Very piercing command that even goes further to give us specific details about what we are not even to covet. Now, brothers and sisters, before we dive in and look exactly at what these commands forbids us, it's, a, it's important for us to mention that this 10th command is one that many of us here would struggle with. Maybe as I read it through, you are still thinking at the least of the things that God tells us not to covet. Maybe as we come to this last of the 10, uh, ten words of the 10 commandments, Maybe you have been, we have been going through this series of the Ten Commandments, and maybe you have been thinking or even saying, like the young rich ruler who went to Jesus in Luke 18, verse 18, and asked Jesus, what must, must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus recited the commandments for this man. But you guess what? Every time Jesus would tell him, uh, you should do this or you should do this, he said, well, I kept all, all of those. I have kept them since I was young. Done. Maybe that's what you have been feeling as we look through these Ten Commandments. But brothers and sisters, it is in this last commandment that we clearly see the man's heart exposed by Jesus. After Jesus told him uh, that he, 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 had, he was very happy to hear that this guy has been keeping the commands, Jesus exposed his heart by telling him, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. After hearing these words, Luke tells us that this rich young man became very sad for he was, he was extremely rich. Clearly, this is a command that many church-going people like you and I gathered here this evening would struggle with. I personally love how um, Martin Ruther uh, helpfully put it when he was commenting on the th Ten Commandments. He says this. He says, this last commandment is addressed not to those whom the world considered, considers wicked, but precisely to the most upright, to people who want to be commended as honest and virtuous because they have not offended against previous commandments. Here in this Tenth Commandment, we find a sin that is so insidious that many of us would want to put into fine front and to conceal it, even maybe give it a new name. I'm just admiring what another person have. What's wrong with that? This is what you and I do when it comes to the sin of coveting. We have to conceal it. And that's what we really need as we come to the Ten Commandments, is to get a CT scan or an MRI of the soul to help expose our heart. With that said, it's worth spending the next few minutes get, getting to understand then what is this commandment all about. To start, what, to, to start with, it's worth defining and clarifying exactly what this command, commandment means. What does coveting exactly mean? It's not a word that we would use um, on a daily basis. What exactly does it then mean? In fact, it's even helpful to kick off by first noting what it doesn't mean. And two things I want to mention in here. So what exactly is coveting? First, coveting is not the same as having desires. Coveting is not the same as having desires. You see, dear ones, the Tenth Commandment does not prohibit every kind of longing all want, all thought of having, you know, something nice or better, not at all. 
Rather, what this command calls us to do is to replace the wrong desire that will be brought because we are wanting what someone else has. And we, this commandment calls us to replace that wrong desire with the right desire. You see, it's very tempting to read this command and think that what it prohibits us to, to have is desires. If that's how we think of this commandment, then we have invented another religion besides Christianity. And in fact, that religion is Buddhism. I don't know how uh, familiar we are with world religions, but in Buddhism, desires are to be suppressed. They are the places where evil comes from. So what you do with desires in Buddhism is you suppress them. Don't talk about desires at all. But that's not the case with Christianity. And that's not what this commandment is prohibiting. Coveting is not the same as having desires. Desires are good in and within themselves. But what this commandment tells us or calls us to do is to replace the wrong desire with the right desire of good things. The other thing that uh, coveting is not is that uh, what we need to note is that the law against coveting is not a law against feelings. Again here, uh, dear ones, this command does not forbid you and I to uh, from offering a heavenward lament or prayer to God saying, God, I wish there was some other way. The Bible, in fact, has examples of people who had real feelings and did express them. One such person that comes to mind is Hannah. She had a desire to have a child. Even when she would see her children from, um, uh, from Penina, but she would have that desire and feeling of feeling, telling God, please give me a child. And the Bible does not say that that was a bad feeling or a bad desire that Hannah had. In fact, she is commended for that. You see, clearly, friends, this 10th commandment isn't here to make us unfeeling creatures. It's not here to make us uh, unfeeling creatures without hopes or dreams or even a passion. And thus, it's good to emphasize here that the law against coveting is not a law against feelings. It's not the law of saying you should not have desires or you should not have feelings. That's what coveting is not. With these clarifications then about what coveting is not, then it would be good for us now to see what then does it mean? What does, what is this command uh, mean? What is it? What is it um, that this commandment uh, tells us to do? First, we will see two things here, that we covet when we want for ourselves what belongs to someone else. We covet when we, went, we want for ourselves what belongs to someone else. Right, coveting is more than thinking it would be great to have a nice house or I would like to have a better job. Rather, looking again in these verses, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, we see that coveting is longing for someone else's stuff or property to be your property or your stuff. To put this differently, coveting says, I want their house. I want his job. If only I could have what they have, then I would be happy. Remember that first question that we started with. This is what coveting is. It is wanting for ourselves what belongs to someone else. In fact, coveting even goes further and says, why didn't you get that? Ken, why didn't you get that house? And it tells you, I wanted it. Coveting tells other people uh, their face. I'm angry because you are happy and I would be happier if we could trade places. Coveting is simply defined as wanting what other people have. And that's the way in which this is sinful. Wanting for ourselves what belongs to someone else. If then uh, coveting is wanting what other people have, 
Then it goes without saying that this sin of coveting is a violation of the second great commandment. I hope we do remember how Jesus summarized the law. He said the law is summarized into two, uh, especially if you look uh, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 to 39. Jesus says, this is how um, he, he sums up the law into these two commandments. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. What this sin of coveting then does is that he fails to love your neighbor as yourself. When you and I are covetous, we think only of what is good for us, what we would like, what would make us happy, and what could make our lives better, regardless of how others are affected by our sin. This is because coveting is wanting for ourselves what belongs to someone else. The Bible is full of examples of people who wanted what belonged to someone else. One classic example that comes to mind is that of a person called Achan. If you read in Joshua chapter 7, um, uh, there is the Israelites, they are fighting against um, a city called Ai, and then the Lord had made it very clear to these people that you're not supposed to take anything or things that are devoted for destruction. But guess what? This guy called Achan does. We read in Joshua chapter 7 verse 21 that when Achan saw some of those devoted things, he first coveted them and then he took them. They didn't belong to him. They are actually things that were devoted for destruction. But he coveted them. And then he took them. And guess what? His sin caused a lot of trouble at the camp of Israelites in that they were defeated by I. Coveting is wanting what belongs to someone else, saying, I need it, and taking it. Again, in the New Testament, we see how this sin of covetousness is described in that it leads to quarrels and fights. Hear what James says in chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. He says, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Here is what this sin of coveting does. It makes us quarrel and fight others. It makes us forget the second commandment of loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. And at the end, it leads us to death and destruction. Coveting is a sin that wants us to get for ourselves what belongs to someone else. And not only that, uh, the second thing that we see about this scene is that we covet when our desire leads us to being discontent. To put this differently, coveting is an expression of discontentment. Friends, we covet, when we covet, you and I, at the heart of it is that we do not believe that God is big enough to help us or good enough to care for us. Our discontentment thus becomes an expression of how much less we think about God and even how much more we think God owes us. In fact, at the height of our discontentment, God is telling us one thing. I'm the only God that you need. Do not turn to other idols. Do not turn to bowl or statues. Do not turn to animals or friends or abilities. God calls us, you and I, to let nothing uh, capture our gaze and even affection of him. But when this sin of coveting comes to our hearts and it's inside us, we forget about God, we become discontent, 
We forget about what he has given us. What is even striking about this scene is how Paul writing uh, about it. He calls it idolatry. Hear what uh, Paul says when he's writing to believers in church in Colossae, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. He tells them, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Then he names what is earthly in them. He, he names sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire. And then he finishes with this sin of covetousness. And then he says, which is idolatry? Do you see what makes this sin idolatry? It is idolatry in that it makes us say, I can't live without that person. I can't live without that possession. I can't live without my neighbor's house. I can't live with my, without my neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is my neighbor's. Clearly, when I say this or when you say this, we are making God out of our desires. And this then command calls us to do one thing, to be content with what we have, to not want to take that which belongs to someone else, to not want someone's house or wife or servant or ox or donkey or even anything that belongs to our neighbor. Maybe as I just read through this 10th commandment, you're looking at it and you're reading it with your 21st century eyes. Look down with me again what this commandment says. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbors. Maybe you're reading this and you're looking at it with what you might call 20, 21st century eyes. And if you do so, you might probably state with all honesty that you have not coveted your neighbor's ox. Because even my neighbor doesn't have one or his donkey. But you know what, brothers and sisters, the truth of the matter is you and I have coveted what our neighbors have, their car or their clothes, or their athletic body or an ability, or their social status, or their children. And the list goes on and on. This sin of coveting what belongs to someone else seems to get right to the marrow of our bones. No wonder then, this commandment wants us twice. I hope you noticed, you noticed how twice the word you shall not covet is repeated. And it does so because we have the capacity as foreign human creatures to lie to ourselves about what we are doing or even to want to cover up what we are doing with this sin that is insidious. This last commandment thus comes with a double negation. You shall not covet. And not just that, it comes with much specificity of the kinds and the things we might be tempted to covet that belong to our neighbor. It calls us from, desire, from a desire in what belongs to others or thinking that uh, what we own or what we can, uh, what we, we can be what we own or what we wear or what we drive. And the more reason that you and I thus need to hear Jesus' warning to his disciples when he tells them in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Those verses that Pastor Fidel helped us look at at the beginning of this meeting. You and I are to take care and to be on our guard against this sin. Again, it's breaking this commandment and then adding up, coveting what belongs to our neighbor, their house, their wife, their servants, their ox or donkey, or even anything that belongs to them.
Now, before we conclude, it might be good to just also answer one question. How can we tell? And how would you and I know if we are coveting? What does it look like? And what will be some of the outward manifestations of us violating this 10th commandment or breaking this 10th commandment? I like how one other and pastor called Kevin DeYoung gives a very helpful exposition of these 10 commandments in a book uh, called The Ten Commandments, What They Mean, Why They Matter, and Why We Should Obey Them. And this book, he suggests the following four signs that can help you and I know that we have a big problem of coveting. These four things will help you and I know um, when we break and violate these 10 commandments. Let's look at them uh, briefly. The first way that you and I can know that if we are coveting is that you might be coveting if you have hurt others in order to get more yourself. You might be coveting if you have hurt others in order to get more for yourself. Here, brothers and sisters, is indeed a very good sign to us that we are coveting what doesn't belong to us. It's when we hurt others with our actions and even maybe more likely with our words and attitudes and looks, maybe even with our sneers or even neglect in order to get more for ourselves. You and I would agree with me that we, the sad reality is that in our workplaces or even in our areas of residence, we are surrounded with people who care only about themselves Many in our society, from ranking politicians to policemen on the road, to people in our offices, we will hurt others in order to get more. And thus, by doing this, they clearly violate the 10th commandment. They covet that which doesn't belong to them. They are not content with what God has given them. And thus, they are very happy to hurt others in order to get more for themselves. And maybe it's good for us to pause and to slow down a bit here and ask ourselves, how are we doing in this? Could it be that as Christians, we are those who covet what belongs to other people? to an extent that we go ahead and hurt them in order to get more for ourselves. May the Lord indeed help us. The second um, way that you and I can know that we are coveting is that you will be coveting or you might be coveting if you are preoccupied with making and accumulating more. I'm sure all of us know the parable of the sower or have heard about it. Jesus gives uh, this parable and says how different uh, seeds fall in different types of soils. In this parable, Jesus talks of some seeds that fell on the thorny soil. These seeds started to bear fruit, only to have the seed chopped out by the deceitiveness of riches and the worry of life. And I hope we do get the picture from Jesus in this parable that these people didn't simply wake up one day and say, you know, from now on, it doesn't matter what I'm do. I'm going to cheat or lie or steal or get my way to the top. No. You see, these people didn't make a conscious decision to turn from God to riches. Rather, they just got too busy, too distracted and too concerned about lesser matters. They got too preoccupied with making and accumulating more. And at the end, these things that they want to possess end up possessing them. You know, every time I read this parable of Jesus, I do examine my heart to see whether is deceitfulness of riches getting at the heart, at my heart? Am I coveting what other people have? 
that I get too much preoccupied with making and accumulating more, even sometimes getting things I really don't need so that I can be like other people. What about you? Moving on to the bad thing uh, that, um, uh, that Kevin DeYoung suggests is that you and I might be coveting if we are unwilling to give up what we already have. You might be coveting if you are unwilling to give up what you already have. Here, Fred's is another form of coveting that I guess is way too common to many of us. It's when we hold on tightly to our stuff or to the things that we own instead of letting some of the blessings of these things slip through our fingers to others. You and I will be breaking this commandment if we hold on too tightly to stuff and even do not want others to get them. Someone was reminding me today that even this scene of coveting sometimes makes us not want other people to get what we have, which is quite sad. In fact, Many other times when we are even unwilling to give up what we already have and even probably not using, which might also be a huge benefit to other people. We are unwilling to give up what we already have. A sign that we might be struggling with this sin of covetousness. May the Lord help us as Christians who live in a community with other brothers and sisters, maybe who aren't as privileged as we are. But we won't be uh, too preoccupied with just accumulating more or even be unwilling to give up what we already have that might be of a huge benefit to others. For then lastly, he says that you might be coveting if we are frequently grabbing about the general state of our life, be it our house or our spouse or the quality or quantity of our possessions. You see, it's very easy for us to think the next thing that will finally make us happy. What is that? I would be happy if this or that or that happens. And then with this then, it makes us to be so ungrateful with what the Lord has already given us. With us going to frequently grab about our houses or our spouses or the quality or even the quantity of what we have of our possessions. For some of us, we are never even satisfied with what we have because we have this deep longing to want to get more and even to acquire more, just a little bit more. And then that will make us happy. But you know what? We are not alone in this because we actually behave exactly what our first parents did in the Garden of Eden. God had told them that they can eat from any tree in the garden except from fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But we read the following words in Genesis chapter 3 verse 6. And you know what? You and I do exactly that when we covet that which is not ours, when we grumble about what God has already given us and are not grateful about what he has given us, when we want that which belongs to someone else, be it their wife or their donkey. And so, brothers and sisters, we see here in this 10th commandment, it calls us from this very corrupting sin. And how bad is it? It's so evil. It's so wretched and so corrupting that it gets at the deepest level of our hearts. One preacher um, even said that even more dangerous than sins of the flesh is this sin of covetousness. He says, other sins, and even looking at the other commandments that we have looked at, they can be temporarily satisfied, but this sin of coveting what belongs to another person never is satisfied. It never sleeps. It never rests. It's the only sin, he says, that trumps last. And thus, we find that this to be true in our own life when we hurt others in order to get more for ourselves, when we are preoccupied with 
and accumulating more. When we are unwilling to give up what we already have, and even when we frequently grab about what we have, never been grateful at all to what God has given us. And so, in conclusion, dear ones, then this is how we ought to respond as a way of application to these ten commandments. And I want to suggest just three quick applications for us that you and I ought to respond when it comes to the ten commandments. First, we need to be grateful to God for what we have. You and I need to be grateful to God for what we have. In many cases, brothers and sisters, this sin of coveting other people's properties is fueled by our lack of being grateful for what God has given us. For you and I to be able to overcome and fight this sin, we are encouraged by scriptures to be those who always give thanks. We are to do what a famous song calls us to do. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. <clears throat> and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. If we do this on a daily basis, then we will overcome the temptation to want to look at what we do not have. We will be able to overcome the temptation to look at what others have and coveting that. If we are grateful for what God has given us, then it goes without saying that we'll be able to deal with this sin, which Paul calls idolatry. Another way to respond is that we ought to be content with what we have. We ought to be content with what we have. As we have already seen, this sin of covetousness is fueled by our discontentment, not being happy about our situation and our circumstance. And then, for you and I then to, to be able to fight this sin, we need to learn how to be content with every circumstance that the, God, the good Lord puts us in. We are to be content with our house or our spouses, be it our wives or our husband. We are to be content with our male servant, with our female servant. Yes, you and I need to be content with our ox or donkey. And the list goes on and on. And by the way, we will also be content even if we do not have the above things mentioned there. Because we know that those things have not been given to us and have been withheld from us by a good God who loves us and cares for us. We will thus be happy with the circumstance that the Lord has put us in and would want, would, would want to get what um, comes from the heart of a good God with a lot of contentment. But finally, brothers and sisters, we are to pray for God's help. We are to ask God for help when it comes to dealing and to fighting this sin. The Bible clearly tells us or calls us to cast all our burdens to God for he cares for us. You and I then ought to come to God in prayer and ask for his help in overcoming this sin and being content with what we have. We are to pray to him to help us in living as his word calls us to do. We are to ask him that would you help us, Lord, to put to death what is ugly in us, which includes covetousness, which is idolatry. In fact, we are to pray to God to help us to heed that warning Jesus gives in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, when he says, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life doesn't consist in the abundance of his possessions. You and I can indeed do these three things. We can be grateful to God for what we have. We can be content with what we have. But you and I can also pray to God for help. And should I add here, as I, as I add, that our hope, brothers and sisters, as those who have failed in one way or another in this last ten, the last ten commandments, or even in all of the Ten Commandments, that our hope is in Christ. Our hope, friends, rests on Jesus, the second and the better Adam. Unlike our first parents who sinned and broke this very commandment of coveting, Jesus came and he obeyed where our first Adam failed. He came so that he can help you and I 
he came and kept all these commandments, including this ten, ten, the Tenth Commandment. And thus this evening, our confidence is not in our ability to keep this commandment. For you and I will surely fail. Our confidence for you and I is in Christ, whose perfect obedience led him to fulfill the law. With us, even in our own sinfulness, can look to him and put our trust in him. We can come to him again and again when we fail in keeping this commandment. And we can do so with confidence, for we know that in him we find the forgiveness of sins. In him, we will find full pardon of our, for our sins, past present and future in him we will find forgiveness even when we have failed terribly in this 10 commandment so may the lord help us indeed to live as people who have been res rescued by jesus but also to be those who run to him to jesus our redeemer who has perfectly obeyed even this 10 commandment may the lord help us indeed to look to Jesus, who is our hope and our confidence. Amen.